They really do. And, and they have a good heart. They all have good hearts. They're like, hey, ma'am, we, we just want peace and love. And they're being manipulated and they don't know it. And it's to a degree where you can't even say anything because well, silence kind is of complicity. What good heart do you have when you get shouted down? No, I, I'm, I'm just telling you where the, the, who I spoke to. This is where they're coming from. They're coming from a good place, but they're underinformed. They're ignorant. They absolutely do not know. And what is the one thing they say consistently? Well, it's systemic racism. That's what we're against. Institutional racism, systemic. It's the we have to get rid of this everywhere. Enter Bob Woodson. I found another interview with Bob Woodson. This is the guy who uh, exited the civil rights movement that he was in. He's a, in his eighties, I think, late seventies. He runs the Woodson Institute. And he was on uh, American Thought Leaders on the podcast. Three clips, but I think they are incredibly important to understand from this former civil rights ADOS black man. We have to do colors. they put him on CNN? Oh, well, listen to what he has to say, and the answer becomes clear. And so I really think that um, this talk about institutional... I don't know what institutional racism is. I want someone to... Stop the clip. I think you've mixed it up. This is actually Fauci. (laughs) Sorry, I was lowering my desk during the clip. <laughs> no, it's uh, it's actually Bob Woodson. And so I really think that um, this talk about institutional, I don't know what institutional racism is. I want someone to tell me what that means. I believe that the reason that they keep invoking it is because it prevents black elected officials who have been running these cities, they're liberal, democratic Mayors and city council members, school board members been running our cities for the last 50 years. And those are the places where they identify the largest amount of inequities exist. Well, they don't have to then answer the difficult question. If you were elected on the promise of improving the conditions for the least of these, Why are students, why are children failing in systems run by your own people? So to avoid answering that question, all they've got to do is point to some abstract notion like institutional racism. Somehow white America has found a way to compel black professionals to miseducate their children (laughs) (laughs) in schools run and controlled and financed by them. But they don't have to answer that question as long as they can keep the public's attention focused on institutional racism, whatever that means. Then they don't have to address the the, the difficult questions. I had never thought of it that way. I think he's spot on. And we need to start asking people or finding definitions of institutional racism. Um, But what Woodson is about to say here is what he believes is actually going on an abuse of demographics and data all hidden under this guise of institutional racism. First of all, you cannot generalize about the black community anymore than any other people. We're not monolithic. We have difference in education, difference in income. And when it's convenient, we generalize the black community and we use the demographics of those who are living in the most ch- troubling situations. We use the demographics of, the, uh, of incarceration, of low income uh, housing. We use that demographic information to make a case that all blacks are suffering. Okay. And then when the money arrives, it goes not to the people suffering the problem, but those who are providing service, for instance, in the last 50 years, the government spent $22 trillion on programs to aid the poor. 70 cents of all those dollars go not to the poor, but those who serve poor people. They ask not which problems are solvable, but which ones are fundable. Then you have black elected officials, many of them were veterans of the civil rights movement, who then came into political office. They were the ones who were dispensing those funds. And listen to this. Two out of 10 whites who with college degrees works for government. Six out of 10 blacks with college education works for government, which means that the vast amount of money that has been spent on the poor that has produced and reinforced dependency have been administered by a lot of middle-class blacks who then elect 
those into office in those cities who continue this funding. And so as a consequence, over the past uh, 50 years, if you look at the biggest income gap in America, it isn't between whites and blacks, but it's between lower income blacks and upper income blacks. And so the question, if that is true, if racism is the culprit, then why are not all blacks suffering equally? And, and so that you have uh, a lot of professional blacks are, uh, are operating in, in a, a, a professional class whose careers depend upon having poor people to serve. Yes, it doesn't, and, and these are not ill-intentioned people, but they're you talk about structural racism is structural inequality, which means that you've got one class of blacks whose careers and future depends upon another group of blacks who are dependent. So that if your career as a professional service provider is, depend, is dependent upon having dependent people to serve, what incentives do you have to promote independence among the class of people who are down and struggling for independence and self-sufficiency? You do not have one. Now, it's just his view, but he has some uh, credentials in the area. I think his view is accurate. I think it is, too. I mean, you cannot deny, if you look at Baltimore, what's been going on. That's a great example of what he's talking about. But, you know, the, and, and actually it was interesting, uh, some troll in the troll room, whose nickname was Defund, said, this is a skewed uh, right-wing view of history. It may be. That's possible. I don't know. Sounds pretty feasible to me. Well, I, what, what history are we talking about? I don't know. I'm just telling it you. This sounds is, like sociology to me. That doesn't how, sound like history at all. That's how people are triggered, man. They just, and, you know, Hey, handle, defund. What does that tell you about this person? Uh, final clip, a little shorter. Um, so what is really going on here? What is really happening? Uh, well, it's white guilt as we'd expect. As instruments of institutional racism... They don't live in those communities that are suffering the problem. Their children are not in the foster care system. And so you have an unfortunate situation where middle class, uh, I call them grievance-oriented, middle class, privileged elites are the ones on television shaking their fists, claiming that America is incurably racist. And they are preying on the guilt of white Americans who are writing checks to them. So they are personally enriching themselves and their organizations in the name of, of, of champions of we just saw this. social justice. And they are taking money in the name of uh, uh, addressing an injustice. But the people will, uh, who are going to suffer from this arrangement will be the people in those communities. Because around the country, recruitment of a police officers is down 62 percent. It has the highest kind of dropout rate of people. Suicide rates among law enforcement is high. And that is 86 percent of the police chiefs said they're having difficulty recruiting people. And so there, what happens in some cases, in some cities, the police are unable to respond appropriately for, to 911 calls because they don't have enough officers to cover it. It's, uh, it's in the show notes. Well worth listening to the full hour of Bob Woodson. 